Thank you. Thank you. Um, and yeah, as you said, I think uh, it, is, it is nice to have a bit of diversity of topic as well. So thank you very much for having me on the agenda. Um, and also, I'm very relieved that I'm not the only non-technical presentation today as well. So that's always, that's always a, a nice start. Um, so before I get into the content of the session, just a quick introduction to myself. So I'm Louise. Um, I'm a senior manager in PwC's Global Threat Intelligence team. So I'm based in London, but I have colleagues around the world, so the US, Australia, um, across Europe as well, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, you get the picture. Um, so my background is, maybe you would have guessed this, but non-technical. So I studied uh, Eastern European languages and politics and security at university, both undergrad and master's level. Um, before I joined PwC, I worked more in the kind of traditional political risk security space, so not really cyber related at all, more thinking about kind of terrorism threats and political stability in Europe and the former Soviet Union region. Um, so I joined PwC's threat intelligence team um, just over seven years ago, um, and that was very much with a view to providing more strategic and geopolitical context to the technical analysis that was already going on in the team. Um, in addition to my day job, um, I also host a podcast for PwC, so if anybody's looking for some thrilling content to listen to on your journey home tonight or tomorrow, then I recommend the A to Z of Tech podcast, a little shout out there. Um, so a little quick introduction to what I'll be covering today um, before we get into the actual session. Um, so maybe the main question is, what actually is strategic threat intelligence? What do we mean when we say that, before I can answer that main question of why it actually matters? Um, where does it fit within CTI? Um, I'll probably be touching on a couple of methodologies that I'm sure you're all already familiar with, so I won't labour those points. Um, then providing a couple of case studies, so both on the analysis side, so kind of what I actually do in my, in my day job, and then also thinking a little bit about the application of strategic threat intelligence in the real world as well. And then leaving you with a couple of takeaways and conclusions, and then if there are any questions, I'm obviously happy to answer those here, or later on I'll be around all day too. Um, but I think hopefully you'll all agree that threat intelligence has, it does feel like it has very much come to the fore in the past few years. I think obviously helped by um, the implementation of frameworks like Tiber in Europe and CBEST in the UK, really driving kind of the importance of threat intelligence and the value that it can bring to the wider cybersecurity picture. But I think as was maybe alluded to in the introduction, strategic threat intelligence can sometimes feel like the sort of um, the younger child that maybe doesn't get quite as much um, attention. So hopefully in the next 20 minutes or so, I'll just be kind of walking you through some of the value that it can bring. Um, and as you've maybe already guessed, I do have a massive vested interest in this because it is my day job. So I'm also here to try and justify what it is I do every day at work. Um, Okay, so as I said, I think it's probably sensible to take a little bit of a step back and think, okay, what, what actually is strategic threat intelligence? What do we mean when we're talking about that? And I'm sure we've already seen this in the slide, uh, I think in the session yesterday, and this is something I'm sure you're all familiar with, so I won't go into a huge amount of detail on this one. Um, but obviously on the left we have the technical threat intel, which is often answering that kind of what question. So it might be in the form of automated feeds, often indicators of compromise um, at the atomic level, maybe not with a great amount of context, but it's often something that is immediate, can be actioned straight away, and is often very useful for kind of instant response teams, SOC teams, being fed into seams, or endpoint detection, that, that kind of thing. Then moving on into the middle, towards the more operational side of house, that's more kind of answering that how question. Um, so that might be moving towards things like scenario development, thinking more about TTPs, threat actor behavior, um, trends that we're beginning to see. And then finally, last but not least, um, moving on to much more to the strategic side of house, which is more thinking about that that why question, like what's the so what and what we're seeing, um, can often be forward looking as well, which I think begins to differentiate it from maybe the tactical and the operational side of things. Um, often thinking about, you know, providing the context of activity that we're seeing, what's the significance of what it is. Um, and in particular, often helpful for organizational leaders, business leaders. And I think at this point, I'll just flag that it is 
really important to think about the audience that this is aimed at as well, as much as the data sources which are informing it. So on the strategic side of house, the audience is often that more kind of exec level, as I said, kind of organizational business leadership type of, type of uh, audience. Um, okay, but I still haven't answered the question, have I, of what actually is strategic threat intelligence. Um, when we think about definitions, because of where cyber threat intelligence has grown out of, often they have like a very defense or policy oriented angle to them. So you can see that top definition there in terms of what is strategic threat intelligence is from the US uh, Department of Defense. So intelligence that is required for the formulation of strategy, policy, and military plans and operations, which I think is a great example of really it's, it's got a very military focus there, which maybe isn't that useful when we're thinking in the cyber threat intel side of stuff. So the second definition is one that I came up with. Um, so if anybody has any other suggestions, I'm all ears either later on um, or in the, in the kind of questions at the end. So my suggestion is providing contextual analysis to inform and facilitate senior decision-making processes. Now that's not a perfect definition, but I think begins to help us move away from thinking in that kind of specific military and policy angle. And the bullet points there, you can now begin to see some of those factors that we take into consideration when we're thinking of what informs strategic analysis and strategic threat intelligence. Um, this isn't the be-all and end-all. There are loads of other things which I will come on to. But I think give you a flavor of some of the topics that, that we begin to think about when we're talking about strategic threat intelligence. And I think really this is almost the crux of strategic threat intel. Um, it is really that having an understanding of a country's priorities, of its challenges, can really begin to help inform what it is we're thinking about and what, what we're talking about. And cyber activity, particularly when we're thinking about nation state aligned activity, um, it is going to be aligned with some of these factors as well. You know, I think it is easy, particularly when we're talking to maybe people in that exec type audience, it is easy to, it is easy to forget that there's somebody behind the keyboard. There's somebody who's been given tasking. There's somebody who's been given requirements or has their own KPIs. Um, so this doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, for example, why might one government's Ministry of Foreign Affairs be targeted and another country's not be? You know, there's, there's a reason behind that. And strategic intelligence helps us to begin to unpick some of that understanding. Um, okay, so now this is where it begins to get a little bit messy. <laughs> Um, so, of course, strategic threat intelligence and strategic analysis don't just apply at the country-specific end of things. And so on the left-hand side, you can see some examples, again, a little bit more granular, of what we might take into consideration when we're thinking about some of these factors. So that might be conflicts with neighboring countries or even more regional complexities. Um, it might be how deeply involved is the government in the economy or in particular sectors of business. Um, how stable a, a, a country is it? Does it have problems with the rule of law or with democratic processes? Equally, we can think at a sector-specific level as well. So, you know, particularly if we're thinking about critical national infrastructure, there might be specific elements we want to take into consideration there. Is it a sector which is particularly politically significant? Is it one which is integral to a country's economy, for example? Um, and then moving on, of course, there's also organization-specific considerations as well. Um, so, for example, is an organization particularly involved in mergers and acquisitions? Does it do a lot of deals work, which might change its threat profile? Does it have political links? Does it, for example, have politically exposed people on its board? Does it have joint business ventures with state-owned enterprises? All these types of factors can begin to change the cyber threat profile for a particular organization. You can see this is quite a long list of, of, th of things. Um, and personally, I think this is one of the reasons why it can be quite difficult to communicate the value of strategic threat intelligence, because it is, it is messy. Um, it can be quite hard to pin down exactly what it is 
we're talking about when we're speaking about strategic threat intelligence. This isn't a nice and neat kind of list. Um, it's also quite difficult, or it can be quite difficult to ingest as well. Strategic threat intelligence doesn't often come in kind of a, like a nice, neat list of IOCs that can be tagged and flagged and kind of um, popped into a scene. It, it does, it does get messy, and I think again that's another one of the challenges that we face when we are trying to communicate the value that it can bring. Um, however. I would like to say that it's worth the effort, though, and this is really why I try to sell strategic threat intel and what it is that I do. Um, again, I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the classic pyramid of pain. Um, for me, I think it basically boils down to not all indicators are born equal. Um, so, you know, ba basically the, the level of effort that a threat actor needs to retool when its indicators of behavior have been compromised or have been published or, or have become known. To my mind, strategic threat intelligence sits at the TTP level. Obviously, that's more traditionally associated with, you know, like MITRE ATT&CK framework, for example. But for me, I think it also incorporates considerations like which country or which sector are victims being targeted in, um, which means that it does make it more difficult for threat actors to kind of change up their behavior if we have begun to identify that those kinds of patterns of behavior, for example. So, um, moving on to something that's a little bit more kind of implementable, I suppose, moving away from some of that methodology. Um, I will provide a little bit of context in terms of what strategic analysis looks like in action. So, some of the work that my team does. And then also, as I said, give an example of how it can be used like, in the real world when we're thinking about the application of it for organizations too. So... Um, in January 2021, so nearly two years ago, a year and a half ago now, one of my colleagues, Jack, he identified some activity which we now uh, label white terror, which is, again, referring back to the last session where we were talking about um, Tower of Babel. This is just our naming convention. Um, so this is the threat actor that we call white terror. So Jack spotted this because he had been um, hunting for newly registered domains which were spoofing the GOV kind of government um, uh, term by using the term QOV. Now that's not unusual. I'm sure you've all seen threat actors kind of using that kind of spoofing behavior. Um, it's something that we've seen attributed to a variety of unrelated threat actors. But in this particular instance, Jack was interested because it was being used to fish for credentials related to a Serbian government ministry. So Jack saw this, um, and he began to do a bit more of a deep dive into this, partic this particular cluster of activity. Um, so he saw... As you can see on the slide, there was some very specific geographic targeting. Um, and in particular, the activity seemed to be focused on, as I said, Serbia and also Republika Srpska, which is one of the federal entities within Bosnia-Herzegovina. Now, because of that very specific targeting and my own kind of background and interest in Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe, um, Jack and I had quite a lot of conversations around this activity, possible attribution, so I went away and did some strategic analysis and reporting to complement the technical uh, research that Jack was already doing. So as I said, this was activity that had a very specific geographic focus on Serbia and um, part of Bosnia-Herzegovina. It also appeared to be espionage-oriented and was also, it seemed, particularly interested in the defence sector. Now... It would have been very easy to start drawing conclusions or making kind of analytical leaps about attribution for that type of activity. But being the good analysts that we are, we kind of took a step back um, and thought, like, we need to look at the wider picture here. So I went away um, and did some strategic analysis around the context of the region in particular. Um, and the defence sector within that. So thinking about the vested interests there are in the southeastern Europe region, um, thinking about some of the factors which inform that as well. So things like 
um, national identity, religion, politics, um, borders, um, and actually a lot of those factors are both historical but also still shape the region today as well. Now, I don't have time to go and do a deep dive into exactly the findings that Jack and I pulled out, but if anybody's interested, I do include a link at the end of the slides to a presentation that Jack and I did on this particular cluster activity at the SANS Summit in January of this year, and also a technical blog that Jack published to complement this as well. So if you are interested in knowing about White Tur, then please feel free to have a look at that later on. Another example... Now, a little bit different, um, and it doesn't always necessarily fall into the realms of what we would consider kind of the most pertinent parts of the cyber threat landscape, but thinking about influence operations or kind of also known as information operations. Um, so it is something that we do keep an eye on within our team, and we actually categorize it as falling within sabotage type of activity. Again, this is a little bit of a common theme now in, in my, in my uh, presentation, but there isn't, there isn't a defined definition for what exactly influence operations or information operations are. But normally, um, it's thought to include misinformation, disinformation, activity that we might more traditionally class as propaganda, for example. Um, it's also linked to election hacking as well. It's probably a term that you've heard. It gets flung around a lot um, without necessarily being used completely accurately, but we'll move on from that. Um, but there's another um, case study which I think is, is interesting to flag at the moment, and that's related to uh, the conflict in Ukraine. Um, so we have seen on both sides of the conflict that narratives have been being used to um, push misinformation and disinformation um, along kind of partisan lines, both to domestic audiences, also to international audiences. And thinking about how that situation is developing um, is one area where I think having an understanding of the geopolitical landscape can help us to identify possible areas that could be exploited in the future for this type of influence or information operation. And one particular trend which has sprung to my mind is the uh, so, sort of ongoing partial mobilization in Russia and the consequent um, uh, emigration from Russia into a number of neighboring countries. So including but not limited to um, Georgia, Armenia, Turkey, Kazakhstan. Um, I think it's been estimated that more than 100,000 uh, people, mainly Russian men, have fled to Kazakhstan since the middle of September. And there's also been a number of reports of some tensions arising from this as well. So, for example, there's been reports of housing costs increasing quite significantly in some of the locations which have been taking in uh, these populations. Also, some reports of tensions growing between local host communities and emigre communities over, for example, the invasion in general, also more broadly around Russia's leadership. And thinking about those types of potential tensions, particularly if mobilization were to expand or to continue, as well as if the con conflict were to continue, then those types of societal tensions could be seen as an attractive target for this type of kind of divisive uh, information operation. So whilst we're not seeing that type of activity at the moment, I haven't seen any evidence to suggest this is actually happening, it's one area where geopolitical analysis and having an understanding of global trends can help us to identify possible future flashpoints that could be exploited for this type of activity. Okay, and then thinking in a slightly more practical level, so how can we actually put strategic threat intelligence to, to use, as it were? Um, one example, I mean, there's, there's lots of examples I could have gone into. I think actually one great uh, value add that strategic threat intelligence can bring is providing wider context to investment in IT and cybersecurity programs, communicating that value to leadership, um, you know, asking for, for more in more investment and um, really helping to kind of drive home some of those, those messages around um, the threat landscape and, and the threat profile of a particular organization. But in this instance, I would like to touch briefly on supporting market expansion, which might seem a slightly odd choice of, of use case, but bear with me. So 
When organizations are thinking about expanding into new markets, traditionally they will carry out risk assessments. So that might be considering factors such as um, the risk of bribery and corruption in a new market. It might be thinking about political stability and stability of the, the jurisdiction. It might be considerations around safety and security for personnel who would be deployed there. It might even be around natural hazards. So is it a location which is prone to typhoons or hurricanes? I did say bear with me. I know this is going off on a slight tangent. But I have to say, it seems still to be quite unusual for cyber threats to be considered within that context as well. Now, I could open a can of worms over whether cyber threats can be geographically bound. I don't have time for that today, but it is one of my pet peeves. Um, but nevertheless, I do think that there would be value and there can be value in cyber threats being taken into consideration as part of um, market expansion risk assessments. And um, I'm pleased to say that I have, I have actually worked with one organization that has been doing just this. So I led a, a small team of threat intel analysts who worked alongside our colleagues in our uh, corporate intelligence team. So they carried out a risk assessment for a client who was looking to expand into a new market in Asia. They looked at some of those more traditional business risks that I've mentioned, so corruption and bribery risks and typhoon risk, uh, hurricane risk. Um, and at the same time, we produced an assessment which was complementary to that, looking at the cyber threat landscape. So, as I said, it's a little bit of a can of worms talking about geographically bound cyber threats. But what we did bring to the table was providing um, examples of case studies um, of uh, incidents which had already affected both the sector and the region, and providing quite high-level profiles of threat actors that were known to be active in the region, targeting that specific location. Um, also providing um, some visualizations of what, uh, again, at a very high level, what some of those attack vectors look like. Um, and also thinking about... Um, aligning threat actor activity with real world trends. So thinking about the country's relationship with its neighbors, how that might change over time, and what impact that might have for a company that was looking to, to kind of move into operations into that particular location. So that assessment um, ended up being briefed to a strategic leadership group who had been charged with making decisions about market expansion and helped to inform their um, wider risk assessment and ultimately their decision-making process. So I think that's quite a nice example of how strategic threat intel can bring value both in terms of helping businesses understand the wider kind of operating process, but also um, very much feeding into a strategic type audience as well. So as I said, it was very much kind of aimed at a, uh, at a leadership group. So a um, couple of conclusions. Um, I won't read through these. You, you, you can all read them, I'm sure, and it's, it's not groundbreaking. But I think for me, ultimately, it boils down to strategic intelligence really being able to answer that why question. So what? What can we expect? What can we look to in the future? And ultimately, malicious cyber activity that we spend our days tracking and detecting and reporting on, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. There are reasons why organizations are targeted. Um, and this is where strategic intel, I think, can really help to, to bring value to the table. Um, and as promised, questions, but also a couple of references there as well, if anybody would like to have a look at those too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, I see questions at various places. Um, thanks. Hi. Um, on the topic of the White Tour campaign, uh, what did your organization do either with the analysts internally or externally as far as informing them of IOCs and other types of uh, activity with that? Uh, a lot of that information you shared seems like it'd be perfect use case to create IOCs and inform whoever your communities are so they can start 
uh, alerting on that as well and then re-inform you of, hey, this is what we're seeing. Are you doing anything like that? Yeah, so I don't personally, but yeah, we have a technical team of analysts as well who, um, when we do any analysis and reporting, produce IOCs that are provided to uh, to our customers, but also where appropriate also to wider communities as well. So we, yeah, we absolutely do that as much as possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I just want to add your vision or let's say your opinion on the uh, uh, place, the uh, vision of strategic CTI today. Is it like well developed? Uh, will it be more, could it be more developed compared to uh, operational and tactical uh, level? I think there's always scope for improvement, isn't there? Um, I think different providers, different companies do it differently. Um, just speaking to my personal experience, um, I think the team that I work in, we work very closely together. So strategic and technical analysts sit on the same teams and we have the same types of conversations. Um, and as much as possible, we try to produce complementary um, analysis and reporting. I um, mean, yeah, White Tear is probably a great example of that. I think in general, though, I'd say, you know, even thinking about something as general as, as training and certifications, a lot of that provision still, you know, and for good reason, still tends to be focused on um, the, the more technical end of the spectrum, um, probably less so on the strategic side. Even thinking about tools that we use day to day, again, the majority of our investment and, and use cases are on the technical side. Um, I'd also really like to see more, just just broadly, I think more collaboration between strategic threat intel and the wider political risk community as well. I think there's loads of scope there to, to bring much more value on both sides of the house. So, um, yeah, I, like personally, I'm, I'm excited to see where, where it goes in the next few years. I thank you for that brilliant talk. I think that the threat intelligence community often focus on details on a chess piece, forgetting that the chess piece is on a chessboard that is in a tournament in an international series. So I think that's a, that's really a, br a brilliant talk uh, with examples. So thank you um, very much for that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Not even a question to answer. But no, I think that was a great analogy, actually. I think that the chessboard, it's easy, it's easy just to focus on the pieces and not see the, and not see the bigger picture. Um, and, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to do this job if I didn't have technical analysts to, to work alongside. And my technical colleagues do incredible work. But yeah, I think it's important to have, to have both views, um, and to make sure that, that we can bring this context to the technical analysis as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, once again, thank you for the presentation. It was really great. Um, I got one question. Uh, in the case of the uh, white tur, uh, could you tell us more about the methodology you used? Uh, for example, did you use uh, several tools or did you communicate with the um, um, specific teams uh, in the countries uh, of uh, Bosnia or uh, Serbia? Um, so on the... I'll maybe answer that in two parts. So on the technical side, so I said it was my colleague Jack who did all the technical work, um, and he, it's the top reference there, is a technical blog detailing exactly how he went through the research that he did to identify and track the activity and identify it as, as um, and attributing it to, to white tur. Um, on the strategic side, so um, I, I'm very interested in the Balkans region, so I uh, have have a master's degree in Bulgarian philology, which isn't particularly useful in this particular instance, um, but also uh, have spent some time in Serbia and Bulgaria and North Macedonia. So it's a, it's a region that is very close to my heart. Um, so to be honest, at a high level, it was just, I just loved having the opportunity to spend some time researching this particular type of activity. Um, for obvious reasons, a lot of the research that we focus on tends to be more um, aligned to Russia-based threat actors. Um, so it was nice to have a bit of a mix up a little bit and, and have a look at a different region and a different type of activity. Um, in terms of the tools and the sources that we use, um, so we we have subscriptions to some kind of uh, research-oriented 
kind of databases, so I use that kind of activity, uh, that type of, uh, of resource. Um, also, just a lot of kind of open source academic research as well is always really helpful. Um, knowing a little bit of the local languages too helps when you're looking into some of the more granular details around, like particularly around local tensions and what's been happening recently over kind of borders, um, border checks and customs and all that kind of thing. So I'm um, very much like OSINT style. Yeah. Again, thank you very much. That's great. Thank you.